winter, um, one was to go see the tall ships come in in July 1976 into uh, the harbor from um, West West, the artists of the Lower West Side, where, which was housing for a lot of artists, and we saw these fantastic ships. The second date that I remember was actually a gallery uh, opening in Soho, it was Soho at the time, that was organized by Marcia Tucker, who just left the Whitney and had started the new museum. But she and a friend of hers had started collect, had were uh, having an exhibition of a collection, not of theirs, of someone else's, of historical tattoos. Because Bob had already started making a film about tattoo, uh, tattoo artists because he had seen a show at the Crafts Museum where he worked at a certain point when I was with him. We had a other bunch of career overlaps. I worked as a registrar for traveling exhibitions. We did some shows from the American Crafts Museum. Bob was a photographer for shows that we did and um, things like that. But he got very interested in tattoos. So he also knew that he couldn't access these tattoo artists unless they would ask if you were a virgin, which meant, did you have a tattoo? So he said, well, I'll figure this out. So he tattooed his own leg. So I'm of the area where Bob era, where Bob only had one hidden tattoo, which was not, which was early on, which was early on, right? I have a follow-up story way later from that. But so we went to this tattoo thing, which was really fantastic. They're all little photos, but he like dragged me out at the end when the black leather and chains and motorcycles came in and I started hearing tattoo stories that I didn't really want to know about that much. But uh, let's see, so where do we go from there? Also, I was of the giraffe van era, because after the car, I think you're talking about, there was a van, there are two different ones, which was a giraffe, uh, which was a van, an old Ford, uh, I don't know. Auto a Connell line, right, which I went to the Helminski's in Connecticut and Maine many times in the O'Connell line van. And um, actually, I also have to say, I feel like this is a little bit egotistical, it was funny, but I remember being called by Bob, who was not always the most reliable. He sometimes disappeared for a few days doing a shoot when I was living with him. But at one point, he was somewhere upstate and the giraffe had died. And could I come get him? Which is actually kind of amazing when I think about it, because the car I had access to was in Queens. Did I take the subway to Queens and then drive up to rescue him? But I think I did. Anyway, he was a very engaging human being. So uh, other things to say was, um, let's see. Oh yeah, cockroaches. <laughs> One of the things about living in this fantastic apartment with all these beautiful artistic details and the car that I remember so well, which fortunately, because it was what it was, I never had to clean. And I've been thinking, as my partner, George Johnson, who became a friend of uh, Bobby's, also recognizes, I don't really think I'm a very good cleaner, because I lived in this dense environment. What the hell are you going to do with all this stuff? But he also wouldn't allow the apartment to be fumigated, because Lopsang, his Shih Tzu, that I think has also been referred to here, was this long hairy dog, and he didn't want Lobby to be exposed to this poison. So we had a lot of resident cockroaches because uh, we weren't sprayed, and the rest of this wonderful building on the Upper West Side was sprayed. It was intense. Uh, so, uh, let's see. David. I, I remember David particularly coming to visit us one time. After he'd come into New York, I don't know how old you were, to go to a party, you were living with your mom, and he showed up later. I think his plan was that he was going to spend the night. But he came back and he said he went to this party and everybody, there was a big bowl in the middle of the room and everyone had thrown in a pill and the object was as you would just pick a pill out and take it. And David said, I don't think so. And he came home to us. And that's one of my memories of you, <laughs> really. As well as I know that you became a writer, if people don't know, for David Letterman, right? In your early career, is that correct? Many years ago, but you can get it, give it up. And it's hard to talk after you, David, because that was spectacular. But, but Bob, whenever I talk about Bob, this man, I always say, was the visual and verbal punster beyond all people that I have ever, had ever met. And it was totally amazing. So I'm almost finished. I hope this, I've seen me not laughing as much as with other people, but I hope, I hope, I hope it's sort of amusing. Oh yeah, the other thing he had in his apartment, I remember, which I've told people, is you know, he drove this 
van around, and he, because he worked during the day and did these photography jobs, he parked different places. So one of the problems was, do you remember where you parked your car? <laughs> he had this a map of the neighborhood right in the kitchen door when you came in. Every night he came home, he would pin the keys to his car on the block he parked it so he could remember it the next day. Some of the great things that happened to me, because all these crafts people kept passing through Bob's apartment, uh, and he was photographing their work, but he also taught craftsmen to photograph work and a number of other things that he was teaching at the craft centers. And you know, He was a great teacher. He taught a lot of different kinds of things. This is a little before he just was starting his blacksmithing career, because I know there's some blacksmithing people here when I was there. So, because I was so inspired by this, and actually I'd studied archaeology, I worked in Iraq as an archaeologist, I loved ceramics, and I was having him fill out these forms which said, is this shirt pink, green, or beige? And it's like, they were pink, green, and beige, so what does this mean? And so I did start to go and study, actually making ceramics when I was with Bob, which is one of the best things that I've ever done in my life. My partner George was a ceramic artist too, and there are some things maybe around here from George. So um, I did the ceramics, blah, 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 blah. Um, oh yeah, well, here's the other side, the, another girl side of the story. As our relationship sort of started to break apart, one of the things that Bob was doing was teaching, many things as he said, was photography at SBA, and he was teaching Annie Sprinkle. Do people here know who Annie Sprinkle is? Right, right, exactly, who I hoped would be here. I only met her once in passing. She was the transition after me, which was beyond my idea to compete with, to tell you the truth. Um, and uh, he, Bob said, you know, this woman I'm teaching, um, I think he said a few things, but she worked in a massage parlor, but she was really interested in getting out of that and doing photography. And uh, she decided to come do a shoot in the Caribbean. And as I said, he never traveled very much. And I said, oh, sure, Bob, that's a great idea. Well, that was that. <laughs> that was the beginning of the end of that. Anyway, and then I ran into them once on a bus, as I told David earlier tonight. I was hoping she'd be there because I only got at the bus. Where was Bob and Annie? I'm like, gosh, bye. <laughs> Not bye because of jealousy, just bye. Life is going another track, right? Um, so, end of, uh, so I will say one thing about. He did give you the finger. What fingers? The fingers. The stone, oh, from, a, from finger. here, we the have a fabulous finger. stone finger. But that was from here, from Maggie's <laughs> Maybe he gave us the main finger. It's, it's in the fireplace room. <laughs> it's it's fabulous. Room. Yeah, so, um, so my mother, years after I was not dating Bob, but my parents knew Bob. He helped celebrate my dad's 70th or 80th birthday. I don't really remember. Made these great t-shirts and all this stuff with us. Well, I'm not sure they ever got him, but my mom got his energy. And we went, he was doing a performance at the Crafts Museum of musical instruments. And somehow he had told me, and he was supposed to play, somehow he told me, he was pretty nervous because actually he couldn't really play at all. And he didn't know, although you've demonstrated, or you guys have demonstrated, what he does when he plays, which was amazing. So I went with my mom anyway, but at that time, he was covered with tattoos. It was in a t-shirt, and my mom is looking, and she's going, those aren't real tattoos, are they? And I went, yes, mom. But anyway, that was another thing. So uh, finally, a couple of things, slightly more seriously. One thing Bob and I always said was, so this time I was still studying archaeology. He got me through my PhD orals. I mean, I don't know what I was doing. I was like studying in one of these corner rooms where all this other stuff was going on. But he seemed to go for that. And um, I got him through Edria's suicide or her death, whatever it was. He never believed it was a suicide. In fact, I rescued Lobby the dog from her apartment. And our Shih Tzu that's up there in the car, which is why I imposed to bring my dogs to this thing by a door, was partially because I took care of Lobby for a while um, and picked him up at that time. And I did never like small dogs, but now we have our own little Lobby. And, um, the second thing was, is what did I learn? I learned a lot about art and creativity and craft as opposed to art because as an archaeologist, those things aren't very different. Ceramics, paintings, you know, whatever you find, you're lucky. So that was another input from Bobby. I learned a lot about sex. And I also learned, above all, about, and this is a word George uses, about porosity. 
and non-judgmental engagement with life.